Welcome to devmode.fm, a podcast dedicated to the tools, techniques, and technologies used in modern web development. Ugh, web development. I'm Andrew Welch from NY Studio 107. I'm Lauren from Colorbright. I'm Marion Nullivant, currently in Portland, Oregon. I'm Patrick Harrington from Mildly Geeky in Boston. And with us today, we have Jonathan Longnecker. Jonathan, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. And you're from 47 Media. And Correct. where are you currently located right now? Currently, I'm in my hometown of Knoxville, Tennessee. Hmm. And the reason I'm asking that is that you are usually located somewhere else or a lot of the year, right? You're located all over the place. You that are, yeah, so you travel with your entire family in a Airstream, mm -hmm. yep. an Airstream RV. So you travel all over the country. And in fact, you go to different countries and you work out of there, right? Yeah. We sold our house about three years ago, um, bought an RV and hit the road. And so we've been, yeah, we've been traveling for three years and yes, it does cost money to do that. So I have continued to work <laughs> as, right. as we travel. I yeah. would imagine it would cost a, a good bit of money to do that. <laughs> but I mean, the interesting thing here is that you're a web developer, right? I mean, that's what you do as a profession. Oh yeah. Yeah. 47 media has been around for since 2005. So yeah, I've been doing this a long time. So um, it, it's interesting to me because a lot of people uh, on this podcast, and also I would imagine a decent number that listen to it, um, are freelancers. And the real kind of goal in being a freelancer or working for yourself is that you have the freedom uh, to, in theory, travel around, do whatever you want. However, most of the freelancers that I know... <laughs> <laughs> they, they've got the Lance part, but not the free part. You know, I, I mean, I, I know a lot of people that run their own business that are probably tethered to a, a chair and a desk uh, more than when they worked a, a full-time job. But you, you are actually doing the thing, right? Yeah. And, and I did the other thing, you know, for, for quite a few years, obviously. Um, but I always worked from home when, you know, we never really had physical space, you know, that we rented or anything like that. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it wasn't that huge of a jump to go from uh, working from my desk at home to a desk inside my trailer that moves around. <laughs> um, that seems like a big jump to me. <laughs> well, there, yeah, there were external factors that were very different, but in terms of, you know, not being used to uh, being in an office with other people or being set to a certain schedule um, you know, based on having to, to go to a certain place every day, that wasn't really, happening for me to begin with. So, gotcha. so that did, you know, make it a little bit easier, I guess. Gotcha. So does anyone here know the origin of the term freelance? I feel like it goes back to medieval, medieval days. It does. It's when yeah. you were, you were literally a freelance, you know, yeah. where you took your lance and you just were hired as a mercenary, uh, by the, whatever King of the local fiefdom that would pay you the most amount of money. Yeah. Right. And you were just kind of, a a sword or a gun for hire that just kind of wandered around, you know? Um, so I think it's interesting because we work on the World Wide web and a lot of us are freelancers, but <laughs> most of us just sit in our chair at home and we don't ever travel. You know, if we do any traveling, um, it's virtual by traveling over the web. So Jonathan, why don't you tell us like, what was the impetus for you saying, you know what, screw this. I'm going to pack up all my stuff. And I'm just going to, I'm going to live in my RV and travel around. Sure. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know if any of you guys or girls worked in the expression engine community back in the day. Mm -hmm. Um, but there was a guy named Mike Boink, uh, Boink Interactive, and he started doing this, um, years before we did. And, I kind of mentioned it to my wife. I was like, Oh, this is, this is cool. They're like traveling in an RV. And she said, we're going to do that. And I was like, ah, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and so it, honestly it was, it was more my wife kind of convincing me, you know, over the span of, of probably about a year. Um, I, I mean, it sounded cool, but I'm like the, the super practical person mm. who wants to come up with all the reasons not to do something. Um, but I don't know. I kind of got to the point where 
we were already homeschooling our kids. I already worked from home. Um, and it, I eventually got to the point of why not? Like, yeah. Like what's the difference, right? What's uh, it's a difference, but like, why not try it? I right. mean, we might as well try to have this adventure while the kids are, uh, you know, young enough to want to do something like this. Uh, you know, we did wait till our youngest was three, I think before mm-hmm. we, before we set out, I think if we had, gone earlier it would have been a very different experience there um, might have, there might have been a homicide too yeah uh, a, a lot of diapers and <laughs> oh, it's just God. a whole different thing yeah no. so yeah. um yeah so, she <laughs> we we did a we did a deep dive and you can look back at our at our articles we did a bunch of articles like way back on on the tiny shiny home website where like she wrote her pros and cons and I wrote my pros and cons. And like we, we spent all this time, you know, researching and, and looking into it. And finally just got to a point where, you know, it was just, it was do or die. It was time to do it. So you know, it, it's funny that your wife was sort of pushing to do it because, um, so I, I did some consulting work with you a while back. Right. And uh-huh. I remember yep. showing my wife your website, and I'm like, isn't this cool? And she could see like the glimmer in my eye. And, and she, she just like, gave no. me that stare. She gave me the stare like, no. Don't you dare. Yeah, like, yeah. Don't yeah. even think about it. Like, no way. You know, uh, because in our, I guess our roles are kind of reversed in that. I'm more of the adventurous type and she is more, uh, much, much more practical. So kind of. Uh, sure, yeah. Yeah, kind of more like you are. So how old are your kids? They are six, eight, just turned 11 and 12. Okay. That's yeah. amazing. And you all, so you've got four kids, yourself, a mm-hmm. wife. Do you have any dogs or animals that you take with you? No, we did not. But you have all of this yeah. confined in a 1972 Airstream. Yep. Yeah, it's a 31 foot. So it's like 200 something square feet, I think, total. Wow. Um, wow. Man. Yeah, it's pretty small. Uh, Now, we didn't start out with that, though. We started out with a big uh, fifth wheel trailer. And Mm -hmm. what that basically means is that uh, it connects like in the bed of your truck, like a gooseneck, I guess, is what they're called sometimes, too. Okay. Uh, A lot of horse trailers will attach to a truck that way. Um, But it was huge. It had like four slide outs on it. It was over 300 square feet. The kids had like their own room. Um, we had our own room, like it was, it was ridiculous how big it was. Um, so right now you all sleep in the same room. Um, well, technically yes, but there, there's separation and dividers and stuff like that, but there's not actual doors to separate anything. Right. And I I was talking with Marion, uh, before we started the podcast about this and she made the point that that's how everyone used to live. Right. Oh yeah. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Like sure. the, this whole uh, and Marion, you mentioned this that the, this whole concept of everyone having their own room is a pretty new thing, right? Yeah, and it's not the reality in a lot of the world that now, anyways. Right. And I, you know, I think about oh, you know, you're in this uh, 200 square feet that's so tiny, but there are a lot of people that are in uh, living in densely packed cities like Japan and uh, in Tokyo and other places where. You know, the, the apartments aren't necessarily that much bigger, right? <laughs> no, they're not. Yeah. And yours has the uh, added superpower that if you don't like where you are, you can just leave, right? I got wheels. <laughs> you yeah. got wheels. <laughs> and, I, you know, I, you don't need to all sleep together to keep warm because you just travel south if it gets too, <laughs> gets too uh, cold, right? We definitely follow the weather. Yeah, yeah, you just migrate. Are you like a migratory bird then, you know? Yes, we are. We, we definitely follow like 70 degree temperatures. That's kind of our, our goal. Man. I mean, I, I'm just, <laughs> I'm super impressed that you're able to pull this off. So tell me how it works. Like if you need alone time, like a lot of the, uh, development work that we tend to do, sometimes you need just to be able to focus. Like, how do you, sure, how do yeah. you get that when you don't have a door you can close? I guess ask anybody who works in a cubicle, the same question. Yeah. That, that's fair. You learn. Yeah. Those, those open offices. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I worked at home for years and so you, the kids were there, they were running around and screaming and, oh God. you know, I, there, <laughs> there are, there are times when, yeah, it's like, okay, you guys have to be quiet, but for the most part, you just learn to tune it out. 
Do, um, do you ever just park it and be like, everybody out? <laughs> it's usually the opposite. It's usually that uh, the kids need to do some school stuff and mm. I'm in the way. Oh. And Ash was like, go to Starbucks. And so <laughs> I'll just jump in the truck and go into town. And I see you, you have know, a truck as run. well. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the so our particular setup, the the trailer, uh, you know, connects like a like any sort of trailer usually would to the to the back, uh, the ball on the back. And so, yeah, we, uh, we drop okay. the trailer and then the truck is separate so we can we can leave the trailer and go do whatever and then come back to it. OK, so it's not like one of those self-powered RVs and that's all you got. No, no. Um, and a lot of people that have those, they will tow, you know, a, just a regular vehicle behind them. Right, right. Um, because that would be an option. Right. That would because, be really tough. Because be. I, I, actually, I actually sought out um, John's. Uh, do you prefer John or Jonathan, by the way? Oh, it doesn't matter. My last name's Longnecker, so I have about a zillion nicknames. Uh, that I go by. <laughs> I'm sure you do. All right. So <laughs> I actually um, asked John for some of his expert advice because we were planning a. Uh, family trip to Chicago next month. And I'm like, wouldn't it be cool if we rented an RV to go up there? But the thing is, the, the um, and I don't know the, the proper term for this, but the motor home RVs, the ones that are all one kind of bus, there's literally nowhere anywhere near Chicago that I would be able to park that thing and hook up to water and electricity and all that stuff. So then I would need to tow a car in addition to it. And I was just like, eh, you know what? Like, forget it. <laughs> and you managed to kind of convince me that it would be a better thing to do if, um, you know, like if we're driving to go see some of the national parks or, or something like that, right? Right, yeah. And, yeah, there's there's several versions of RVs. And, and the most popular for renting are the kinds where it's like they take the front half of like a, an F-250 or an F-350 truck and mm -hmm. then they smash a camper on the back of it and it's all one piece. Mm -hmm. Um. And, you know, we've seen those a lot, like we went up to Canada and there was like a zillion of those things that, that people were just renting, you know, and they would have to leave during the day to go exploring. The whole thing would just go with them and then they would come back. But since it was all self-contained, it wasn't a huge deal. But, but that's when you're, like I said, out in nature, like at these big parks where there's expected to be those sorts of vehicles out there. When you start talking about huge cities like Chicago, uh, it's a very different story and you, you probably don't want to be trying to drive that. So I, I, I'm curious about the day in the, the life that you have. So you're most of the time, I would imagine that you're traveling. Like a, there's a lot of driving that is going on. How often do you stay uh, camped at a particular place? See, I'm imagining the opposite. I'm imagining you show up somewhere and you stay for at least two weeks. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's more what we prefer. Um, that's kind of our sweet spot is like one to two weeks in mm -hmm. an area. Uh, any more than that, and we start getting antsy. Right. Uh, you know, less than a week, then it's really hard to get it in, into any kind of work groove. You know, when you're packing up and you're driving, you know, multiple hours a day, and then you're unpacking and getting set up. And um, yeah, you it, we aren't driving that much first of all the gas would be astronomical if right. you were moving like every day um and you just you don't have the time to explore an area and an adventure if you're constantly driving to the next spot so yeah. you want to give yourself some time to to you know figure out what's going on in the area what you can do get time to know the people there and and where everything is and because that a lot of times there's things that are in an area that may not even show up on an internet search. And so you have to give yourself time to you know talk to some people. And I'm a hundred percent on board with that. Like it, it blows my mind that people go on these one week vacations. Um, and often the one week vacations are to like a resort somewhere. Right. Yeah. Right. But the, the funny yeah. thing is like you could, the way these resorts are, you know, whether it's Cancun or, you know, somewhere in Florida or in the Caribbean or whatever, you could be at any resort anywhere in the world and it would be the same damn thing. You know what I mean? You, you mm -hmm. need to have the, the time to get out and to explore the way people actually live. I mean, that, that's the interesting thing to me. Um, so it makes sense to me that you would want to, uh, you know, be at a particular place for a while to be able to actually explore it and enjoy your time there, you know? 
Um, but how does it work from a, a work point of view? So you have a pretty normal schedule. Uh, everyone gets up, has breakfast, and and then how does it how does it go from there? Well, we, so we've been constantly sort of refining that the longer we've been on the road. Um, right now, we've we're trying this thing where we do. I think it's called it. In intermittent fasting where we eat two meals a day basically because mm-hmm. um my wife makes most things from scratch and so we were we were just kind of overwhelmed with with uh food creation and cleanup right. three times a day yeah. so so we we try to eat around 11 and then you know later around six or seven mm-hmm. at night so we just have two meals um but usually i'll try to get up you know earlier in the day um and get started um, before the kids are up. And then with the goal being that, you know, by early afternoon, I'm sort of done with, with the billable work that I need to do. And then, you know, if we're somewhere where we can go, uh, hiking or go explore or go visit, then we've got some time in the afternoon to do that. So that's really interesting. Uh, Jonathan, uh, Melville, uh, who is not on the podcast today, but he's a host, um, we're working on a project for a place called Seaside, where it's kind of a community that embodies the live, work, play idea. Like the idea that you do all three of these things kind of in the same place. And it sounds like you incorporate that into your daily life. Yeah, because I mean, if I worked nine to five every day, then it, this doesn't really work. <laughs> yeah, you, you never see anything. Most of the places we would visit are closed, you know, by five or six. Right. Um, and then a lot of times what we try to do is travel on the weekends to because we, we try to keep a, a pretty regular work week just for clients. Like I don't want to be gone all the time. You know, I want right. to be available for them. And so, um, yeah, so you, you got to figure out how to how to make up that time during the week. And so it's not that hard to get up a little bit earlier or in my case, too, I've you know, I've had the company so long. I charge a decent amount per an hour. And so I don't have to work 40 hours a week. Right. To, you know, so, so I can work a little bit less and have more time with the family, which is kind of the whole point of this anyway, uh, right. is, to, is to be more present, you know, with the kids and to experience these things with them. And I, I can't do that if I'm stuck in front of the computer. Right. Know, and experience more of the world than just that glowing screen that's in front of you. Right. Exactly. Yes. yes. Because and it, honestly, this spoils you a bit because <laughs> the more you get out there, the less you want to stare at your computer. Right. Um, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I could totally see how that would uh, would happen to you now. But how does it work from a, you know, in order to be able to work on uh, these various projects, presumably you need an internet connection. So how does that work? Yeah. Um, so we have quite the nerdy internet set up. Um, and, and so I, I don't know if, if I mentioned before, but when we moved into our Airstream, we actually, uh, we gutted it down, mm. you know, to the ribs, we renovated it completely. Um, and we built it really to be like an off grid, machine basically so we spend most of our time camping not just in like a state park or like a like a public rv park but we're usually like on public lands with no hookups mm. out in the middle of nowhere so when the uh, zombie apocalypse comes like you're totally set you're good we're to go totally set we have tons of solar uh we have a composting toilet so mm. we don't have to worry about dumping black water um we've got a good size fresh tank and we've got uh we've got ways to get, uh, water, you know, we, we can basically transport fresh water and get it in the tank with, uh, various water bladders and Hmm. and containers and stuff. So, yeah, I'm actually um, talking to you from my barn, uh, that I renovate, that I renovated and use as an office. And I have a composting toilet here too. And it, it, it works remarkably well. Yeah, it's good. It's it's not the best for six people. I yeah, would say. that's a um, lot. <laughs> <laughs> but but we love not having to worry about uh, black tanks. And right. If if you're not familiar, that's basically where when you go to the bathroom, that's where all of your stuff goes is into the black tank. It's got to go somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Don't um, dr- don't drink out of the black tank. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. Um, but yeah, so so, so part of the internet. How does yeah. how does that work? As I say, part of the renovation was is that we got to um, really design uh, our internet setup from scratch. And so we have uh, several ways that we 
uh, basically boost the signal. And we do everything with cell phone plans because, you know, you're not going to find Wi-Fi out in the middle of the desert. Um, right. And even if you're at a campground, whatever Wi-Fi they have is going to be horrible. Um, it'll be super insecure and it'll be so spotty and inconsistent that you'll want to like smash your head against the wall. Right. Um, and we did that for a while. Like we, we had, you know, this special piece of, of equipment that would like boost the Wi-Fi signals and like combine Wi-Fi signals. And it never worked. It was just a piece of garbage. Yeah, and, and um, also you'd be traveling from, it would be like traveling to find the next oasis, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and in case you hadn't noticed, like your phone connection is probably way more stable than your Wi-Fi connection is right. nowadays. Right. Um, so the, the hard part is that, uh, cell phone companies really don't want you to use their internet to live off of full time. Mm. <laughs> so they make it really difficult um, to, or they make it really expensive basically to, to get gigabytes, you know, per month. So this goes um, through one of your phones? Like there's no um, satellite sitting on the top of your Airstream? Well, no satellite, but also not through our phones. Okay. Um, we use little hotspots. Oh, okay. Um, yep. We've got we've got one with Verizon and one with AT and T. The Verizon one is a grandfathered plan that you kind of have to know a guy to get one. It's like <laughs> it's like that gray market thing where they they made them a long time ago. They don't sell them anymore. Uh, and we pay somebody a decent amount a month to just sort of rent it from him. Gotcha. Um, but it's like 150 bucks a month for unlimited gigabytes from Verizon. That sounds uh, reasonable. Yeah. And though technically it's not unlimited, like if you use over 200 gigs, then you sort of flag their attention and they might shut it down. But 200 gigs is still plenty. Um, and then the AT&T one, we got in on some kind of uh, weird anomaly where they basically treated the hotspot like a phone where it's, it's unlimited and they might slow you down after so many gigs, but right. they probably won't. You can't get that anymore, but we, we grabbed one. So we've got basically two options. And you just um, switch back and forth depending on which signal you get better or. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's good to have options. Cause I mean, you go some places and, and one is like nothing, you know, and the other one is great or right. a combination of the two. Right. Um, yeah, do, you, uh, do you ever use the, uh, the cell phone coverage maps as kind of a guide to should I travel here? Shouldn't I travel here? Uh, we, we do occasionally, we, there's also some really good resources. Um, campendium.com is one of those. And it, uh, it's a great place to find websites, but it's cool because it allows people to, to rate those. And they actually put in like, Oh, I got this much AT&T signal here or this much mm -hmm. Verizon signal here. And so that gives us a really good gauge of, you know, are we going to be able to do anything here or not? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I have to say that, that even with the hotspots, like there's still additional equipment that we use. Um, and they're basically cell phone boosters and antennas that uh, that boost that cell phone signal. Um, because otherwise, there's a lot of places where, you know, it just wouldn't work. It's right. amazing how well with the right equipment um, you can boost that signal and, and make it usable. Mm -hmm. Now, have you ever been places where you just have no signal and that's it? Like forget. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We Death Valley. There's nothing there, <laughs> um, except at like the visitor center. There was like some 3G signal there. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely been a few places, uh, but we knew about it. It's not like we showed up and like, oh crap, that's not going to work. Like we knew it, and we like planned a long weekend where we didn't, you know, right. need to work or anything. Is your um, is your Airstream air conditioned? Yeah, we have an air conditioner. I was going to say because I I've traveled through Death Valley. And man, mm -hmm. like if you're there at the wrong time of the year, opening the window was like opening an oven door. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, oh, it's brutal. It we, was. We definitely didn't go there in the summer. Like I said, we follow the the good temperatures. So we were we were there when it was bearable. And and honestly, when we're when we're camping off grid, we we don't have enough um, power to run. You know, the air conditioner. Right. So so yeah, we have to if we're camping off grid, we we basically follow the good weather. And the nice thing about the Airstream is it's got a ton of windows, so you can create some really good cross ventilation. Yeah, flow. get some nice airflow. I, I vividly remember when I was younger, we decided to take a family trip driving across the United States. And we're in uh, this old Plymouth Horizon. Like it's not, <laughs> not a fancy car by any means. And I remember like it just being so brutal 
in Death Valley, New Mexico, and I, I we had a, the windows open, and I managed to get sunburn on the bottom of my feet because <laughs> I had my feet hanging out the window, and they got sunburn. And it, I'll tell you, of all the places to get sunburn, the bottom of your feet is the worst. It's like the nut low because you can't walk, like you can't do amazing. anything. Yeah, oh, it's horrible. Oof. So, d- do all of your clients know that you work with that you're basically uh, a free range organic freelancer? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. They, they all know most of our conversations are like, so where are you at today? Right. What's going on? <laughs> right. Because you, you've been yeah. doing this long enough that you probably have not not intimate, but you have a very uh, personal relationship with most of the clients you work with, I would imagine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We've had clients for, for years and years. Um, right. And it's not like I'm trying to hide it. I mean, there's there's multiple references to it on the 47 media site and then my email signature, you know, right. I link out to, to tiny shiny home. So it's. Yeah, it's they they all know what's going on and they're they're cool with it. We I haven't had one client that bought their own airstream and was renovating it. So wow. they were like asking me questions <laughs> and yeah. Thought, what did you cool. tell them to do for internet since both of your best options seem to be not uh, easily available anymore? Oh, well, yeah, so we we've got we've got a whole like deep dive article on the site that kind of outlines all the hardware and stuff. Um, but yeah, finding those plans is a little bit trickier, but there's, there's a few options out there that, that I've pointed okay. into. Yeah. I read your article. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, Lauren, I think you recently made a, uh, transition from living and working in the U S to moving over to, to Germany. So does any of this kind of, uh, story resonate with you? Yeah, I'm a bit of a, a, a nomad myself. So like traveling um, has always been a big part of like how I like to navigate and and work as well. Um, so yeah, uh, a lot of this resonates and I'm kind of uh, <laughs> interested in reading a, a few more of uh, Jonathan's articles to see. When are you going to uh, buy your Airstream, Lauren? I know that's, uh, <laughs> you know, I need to start looking up the prices now. <laughs> And that, and that's the cool thing though about the the job that we all do is that we we probably could do this, you know, if we wanted to, if we put the effort in, we probably could be doing this and working from anywhere that we found particularly interesting. So I mean, you know, it's just something to to think about in terms of the if you're going to be a freelancer, free is part of that word, you know, maybe start taking some advantage of that, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. Where's the, yeah. where's the furthest you've gone, let's say time zone wise? Well, um, we're, since we're, you know, we have wheels, we're, we're mostly limited to where we can get on land. Um, we've, we've been up into Canada and we've been down into Mexico. Uh, but that's, that's about the extent of it, but we've been, you know, on all, all four corners of the U S for sure. Yeah. I mean, in theory, if you really wanted to, you probably could load everything aboard some kind of a, a container ship somewhere and head, head to wherever you wanted to. Right. You could. That that would be an interesting, yeah. Although I yeah. think your cellular coverage might become a problem there. Yeah, we'd have to rethink that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> or you know, get uh, find some, you know, kind of a shady person that can hand you the right equipment wherever you end up going. Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> I think Lauren's brain. She's going to have Germany nailed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. You you mentioned that a number of the places that you visited are are documented on the uh, tinyshinyhome.com. And I just wanted to talk about kind of the, the business aspect of that, because part of your income um, is from the web development you do. But I think you're, you're trying to, or maybe already are, uh, generating income from Tiny Shiny Home, right? We are, yeah, we're trying to. Um, we're, we are a little bit, but you know, we're, we're sort of actively planning right now and and trying to see if there's a market, you know, if there's stuff Mm -hmm. that we can make for, you know, this group of people that are interested in what we're doing. Cause that's Um, just a really cool idea to me. The idea that you could have a website about your lifestyle and journey that then helps to fund your lifestyle and journey. I know. Right. That's the dream. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And I think that that is sort of our, our long-term goal. Um, Cause that means we get to spend even more time with the kids because then that means they are, 
more closely involved with our day-to-day work. Right. Um, Cause you know, we're, we're making videos on YouTube and they're in those videos and um, you know, they're, they're just, they're deeply involved in all this stuff cause it's their life too. So yeah, they could be um, the next YouTube or Instagram star, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Not that I want that for them, yeah. but, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. we're, we're okay with, with semi-famous, but not, right. Yeah. <laughs> You don't want to be, you know, the the long neckers don't want to be the next Kardashians. Is that what you're saying? No, <laughs> no. I, yeah, we're we're good with staying under the radar to a point, mostly because you know we are traveling quite a bit, and so we we have to keep in mind things like we don't necessarily want to post exactly where we're at at the moment, um, which you know we so we kind of backdate things a little bit, um, mm-hmm. just just to this is an added measure of precaution just because we have do we do have so many people that follow us and keep up with us. Right. Um, yeah. So have yeah. you ever met a fan of the blog out on the road? I mean, obviously, you know, it's, it's a big world out there, but. Oh, tons actually. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, you know, the connections and the friends that we've been able to make through, uh, social media, Instagram, Facebook, um, uh, people that, yeah, that, that already followed us. Um, and they're like, Hey, we're in this area. You know, do you want to meet up? And, um, it, it happens quite often actually, yeah. which is kind of weird, but it does. <laughs> when I had plans for stalking you. Yes. Well, that's, I, yeah, I was that's hoping that you would get, that, right? that you would get somewhere near me and then I could just like show up and be like, Hey John, you know, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but the problem is apparently where I live is not interesting at all because you're not going anywhere near me at all. <laughs> Uh, you're in new york right upstate new york yeah i see i've been to upstate new york that was like our first year we were we were up there but you never went back (laughs) no we didn't because we basically we we went west and we're like oh this is really cool so we stayed out west quite a bit yeah yeah because it looks like you're 2018 i'm looking at your kind of travel map of where you're planning to hit I mean, yeah. other than uh, where you live, it looks like you're you're doing just southern United States for the most part this year, right? Well, yeah, that's well, that's where we've been. So, oh, okay, where we're where we're going next is is my wife's family is up in Indiana, so okay. we're headed headed north after this, um, and then uh, we're going to keep going north up to like Minnesota, and then probably loop back around and we're going to the hot air balloon festival in albuquerque in october so so that's sort of our trajectory and i think we're going to try to hit yellowstone and um and a few other of those national parks on now, the way have you hiked your way up to alaska yet no we we have looked into that the the hard part is the roads are so bad there mm-hmm. you could do real damage to your rig if you're not really careful right um mm-hmm. and so we've heard it both ways we've heard some people are like oh it's not a problem and then other people are like you're gonna destroy your airstream if you take <laughs> it up there um which you know i mean the airstream was was six months of ashley and myself and her dad working like six days a week Mm -hmm. right like i mean we put our heart and soul into it like this airstream is never leaving the family so you know like we want to take we want to take good care of it like we don't want to break it so we're kind of torn that we think if we go to alaska we may rent something smaller and do like a short-term trip there um but i don't know we definitely want to go though it looks beautiful there well, you could fly somewhere and then rent somewhere smaller when your your tour of southern France or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overseas could be a thing too at some point. But you, you put all that work into your home. You kind of don't want to leave it behind, though, right? You want to figure out some way to take it with you. Yeah, I, we definitely. I mean, it, like I said, it's never leaving the family, so it'll it'll be used in some capacity. But but in terms of. Um, actually driving it up to and in in alaska um we're just we're not 100 percent sure that we want to do that yet now kind of getting back to the the tech side of things um have you ever had it where the fact that you're on this kind of occasionally spotty internet connection has has caused problems for you uh in terms of you know you're in the middle of updating a client site and there's some kind of a problem and then boom the signal's gone or are you pretty much, you know, you, you're sitting in a place where you know you've got a stable signal before you try anything dangerous? Um, 
I haven't had any catastrophes. There's been a few instances where, for whatever reason, the the cell phone signal blocks certain ports, um, and and makes it hard to you know do SSH work and stuff like that. Hmm. Um, but in that case, it's usually like I just can't do anything to begin with. That's right. not like I can break it halfway through. <laughs> right. um, but no, I I don't. Like I said, the the set, the setup I have is is pretty solid, and and if it's not solid enough, and I because you know we have four kids, we watch Netflix, like we know if the internet's going to work or not. Generally, right. um, if we get there late and it's not working at night, it's like well, it's probably not going to work tomorrow. Um, so it, if it's not, then I'll just jump in the truck and you know head into town closer to signal. Find a Starbucks. Yeah, find gr- a Starbucks. Grab a coffee and sit there for the next six hours right Right. yeah and just kind of hammer away and and do your work right yep oh that's really neat now uh, some questions just kind of more uh personal questions so you've got kids and you said that your oldest was 11 is that right 12 12 she's 12 she'll be 13 in november so what happens when you know she's whatever age you consider appropriate for dating and she's like dad I don't want to leave. My boyfriend's in El Paso or whatever it is. That's a good question. Well, what we probably wouldn't stay, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, my oldest is is super mature and probably wouldn't want to stay around for anybody anyway. Um, <laughs> she's, she's she's very mature. Um, but like, so what's interesting is that our long term plan is actually based a lot around what she sort of wants. And her, her sort of dream one day is to have like her own tiny farm. Right. Um, so within the next four or five years, we'll probably. Wait, your your 12 year old, her dream is to have her own farm. Uh huh. Yeah. She wants her own farm. Yep. Oh my God. Um, my, my 12 year old, my, yeah. <laughs> I've got a nine year old. <laughs> the only thing he wants is his own bowl of ice cream. <laughs> right. I know. I'm telling you, she's like, it's crazy. Um, she's done all the research, like she knows, she knows what she wants to do. So, um, yeah. So, you know, with with the next like four or five years, maybe three to five years, uh, our sort of goal is going to be to see what we can do to support that. And so that would mean, you know, grabbing some land somewhere and starting to build some, some tiny structures. Um, cause farming is the exact opposite of what you're doing now, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, Um, from a civilization point of view. You know, we well, we were we were nomads it's, it's, until yeah. you know <laughs> the hunter gatherers and the farmers. Yeah, yeah. But it's still it's still a lot of of not being super close to tons of people. Right. Um. You know, it's still a lot of that. Uh, being in tune, you know, with the land and like and and not relying so much on uh, outside sources for all of your resources. Like, you know, part of what we have, we've got the solar stuff. Right. So we mm-hmm. don't have to go plug in anywhere to get power. Right. Um, but yeah, she, that's what she wants to do. So we're, we're how hoping... big is, is her tiny farm, her dream, tiny farm? Not huge. You know, she wants some little animals, like um, basically enough to sort of support her and her family one day. So, mm-hmm. you know, not like a, a huge, huge farm where you know she's selling to like how's how she gonna have her family when you you left her boyfriend in el paso man oh she'll be fine have you seen the movie captain fantastic yeah i did yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i was wondering if you were like the real life inspiration for it they, they were a little different they weren't quite as nomadic just the movie they were kind of psycho at the beginning yeah a little we're bit a like little bit that, little yeah. like yeah what are you chomsky patrick what are you yeah. trying to say about jonathan I'm just thinking forward to like when the kids just start proposing to people out of the blue. And, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but there, there's but an I interesting, think, go ahead, Jonathan. Sorry. I was going to say, I, it's funny you bring that up because I, I think probably the end of that movie is, is a lot of probably what she hopes to have mm. one day. Yeah. yeah that, well, I have so. not seen it, so I'm going to have to check oh, it out. Oh, you'll love it. It's a good one. But I think it's a really interesting dichotomy because you are, um, you know, kind of living a nomadic lifestyle and, and yet you are dependent on some very, very, uh, modern things. You know what I mean? Like your job is doing web development, which is, you know, kind of super modern and, and techie. 
So it's really interesting that that has enabled you to get off grid. Well, it's not just that. I mean, it's, you know, the, the road infrastructure, right. Gas stations. Um, yeah. Now have you, you know, just buy food, you know, like we're, we don't, we don't take for granted any of this stuff. Like we know that, sure. that, uh, there's a lot of conveniences that are, are built into this that allow us to do this and to be comfortable, you know, not to be like, we're not like super, super hippie, you know, right. <laughs> like we, we take showers, we, we go out <laughs> to eat, you know, like we, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that you can have this sort of dual lifestyle where right. you're literally living in the middle of the desert. And so you don't, you don't look like your kids don't look like the kid from Mad Max, like dressed in, <laughs> dressed in loincloths. And yeah. Okay. Have you ever had clients <laughs> that, uh, that hear about, you know, you know, I've been to 47 media and, you know, it's a great, very professional site. I could see a client seeing it and saying, you know, these, they look great to work with. Let me give a call or, you know, start to talk and they, you know, where are you located? Do you have staff on site? And, you tell them a little bit more about, um, you know, your arrangement. Has that ever scared someone off? Has it ever worked against you? <laughs> so funny story. Um, I, years and years ago, um, we did a bunch of like print work for my dad's company mm -hmm. um, and, and eventually stopped doing that and just recently had them get back in touch. There's like a new marketing person and they didn't even know that I was related and that I had done stuff for them before. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and she was like, yeah, we're, we want to set up some meetings. And I'm like, well, I'm actually going to be in town in like a month. But and then and she was like, oh, yeah, sorry, we want somebody who's always local. Mm, yeah, <laughs> sure. I, was, I was like, of all places for it to 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 be an issue. Right. But um, yeah, I, I've but, always thought that was strange, though. I, like, yeah, wh whenever weird. I hear someone looking for uh, a contract developer that it's in a specific locale, I've always thought that was really weird. They want to think it. I know where you live. <laughs> I think it started to come back full circle, right? I mean, when this whole web development design thing started, um, there were so few that were actually good at it. You right. usually had to go sort of outside of your local area to, mm -hmm. to find that. And I, and I think that there's a lot of, a lot of shops that are doing well by just focusing on local again. Right. Um, and they're there. I have to do it at a lower price point. Um, but they do it in a way that's more like, you know, if templated is the right word, but it's, it's more sort of blocks that they've built. That yeah. They cookie cutter. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Do you ever run into like anything with, you know, needing mail service? Do you use, are, are there any tips and tricks that you've had to, to, you know, take people that are normally in one place and adapt to your lifestyle? So I, I have plenty of clients that, that mail me checks. Do you have anything like that or, or any sure. way to get around things like that? Yeah. Yeah, there there actually are there are quite a few mail services out there that will do that for you. Um, that will you know accept your your mail and route it to wherever it needs to go. Um, mm -hmm. we, I, I have a question, what Patrick? What is this check thing that you speak of? <laughs> yeah, we we do mostly credit card payments. Yeah, I, I have not uh, yeah. I have not seen or written a check in years. Yeah, but that that two and a half percent it adds up, you know, on right. big projects. It, you it know, does. Look at how much it can be. It, uh, but you can yeah, use something, something like Zello. You can use something like Zello that there's no fee at all. There's a limit. You can only do twenty five hundred dollars a day, but there's no fee. Uh, I haven't looked at that one, but it, I mean, yeah, sometimes when we have a, a large project with a, just a handful of milestone payments, right? It could be you know a, a five digit check um, easily. So yeah, that. Um, yeah. And when you look at, you know, if it's just two and a half percent for the credit card fees, those can, uh, you know, altogether over the course of a year really add up. They do. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm fortunate enough that, that my parents still live here in Tennessee, which is where my business is legally located. Mm. Um, so they let me use their address as, as our yeah, address. You can say, and dad, so, go cash that check, right? Yeah, my mom is really awesome, and she if I get a check in, she'll she scans it. I got her a doxy <laughs> scanner and hooked it up to a Dropbox folder, and so I get copies of it, and she takes nice. it to the bank, and um, yeah, so that that works pretty well. We there's there's only a few things that are really time sensitive, like um, like license plate registrations, you know, that you you have to actually physically mail to somebody. Right. Um, there's been a few of those things, you know, credit cards, if you got an updated credit card or if your credit card gets hacked, which happens more often when you're traveling around, um, you know, you got to get a, a new one in the mail. So, 
obviously they're not going to send it to me in Phoenix or something because that's like fraud alert right there. So yeah, and there's nothing um, funny going on here, right? Like you're not constantly traveling because you're in the witness protection program <laughs> or you're you're running from the law or anything like well, that. Well, I couldn't tell you even if I was. <laughs> so. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So about fraud alerts, yeah. Do you just have a continuous you know, like? Don't worry, we're going to be in a different place every time because, yeah, even if I'm not traveling internationally, if it's domestic, sometimes I'll, I'll try to use a credit card and it'll, yeah, you know, it'll put a stop charge on it or whatever you want to call it. Um, it used to happen a lot more. It doesn't that much anymore. Just mainly when there's there's sketchy transactions. But yeah, yeah occasionally I'll get a text when I'm trying to buy gas, and you know they're like, "Is this you?" And I'm like, "Yes, it is." Well, they they use algorithms for that, so I would imagine once they've settled in and seen that it's normal for you to be doing this, that they probably don't flag it that much anymore. You know? They don't. Yeah. They, they've all gotten pretty good about, but I, don't, I rarely have to call in and authorize a state or anything like yeah. that. So. I had that happen to me. One of the first times that I flew to Japan and I got to Japan and none of my credit cards worked because they put a hold on them because they're like, Oh, you know, last time you used it, you were in New York and now you're in Japan. I yeah. had to get, I had to get, an international operator who barely spoke any English to try and connect me. And oh, it was, just, it was just horrible. And I think it is a bigger deal when you go out of the country. Right. Um, yeah. Again, it's any pattern, anything that's abnormal from your typical pattern, I think is what kind of sets off those flags. And fortunately their algorithms have gotten smarter over the years. So you're probably going to see it a little bit less. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've ma I've made a point to kind of call the bank before I travel somewhere exotic yep. or yeah. or really far. It's like let me make sure that I let the bank know that, because I've had it happen plenty of times where they block my card and I'm like this this we we have to find a solution yep. for this. So I just call ahead. That's what I've learned the hard way to do too. <laughs> you know, might as well just let them know that you're going to be away somewhere or slightly unusual. Um, but Jonathan, I got another question for you. So my kids, I've got just two kids, two boys seven and nine, I have a hard enough time getting them to agree on, you know, what they're going to eat for dinner. How do you handle this when you've got four kids and they all, you know, might want to do different things? I mean, you mentioned that your daughter is super mature and would be okay with um, leaving El Paso, but do you ever, do you ever run into that or are your kids just perfect? My kids are pretty chill, wow. I have to say. Um, but I think part of it too is they've all grown up together. Like they've never been in public school or anything like that. And right. so they're, they're all really good friends mm -hmm. already. Um, in the close quarters, you know, I mean, that's, it's who's around, it's who you have to play with. And yeah, there's days when they get on each other's nerves, but, right. um, but I think that, I think that a big part of having kids with multiple ages together, because if you think about it, most of the time your kids are not with, we're only with kids their own ages. Right. Um, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't foster a lot of like patience or empathy <laughs> for, right. for somebody that's not like exactly your age. Um, and so yeah. the, the thing that I like about this is that they have the opportunities to listen to each other and to say, well, you know, maybe I don't want pizza tonight, but the other three do. And that's just life. Like you got to get over it and, mm. and move on. Like you, you can't, we can't cater to everybody that much all the time um especially kids because then i mean you know what happens right <laughs> spoiled and and all that stuff and we just in such a small space like we ain't got time for that so right. um, <laughs> man i need to i need to sign up for some parenting lessons from you i think <laughs> I really do. but yeah, do you are, do you ever worry about any downsides in terms of your kids you know not socializing or not being able to make friends uh, you know, lasting deep friendships outside of uh, your family circle? No, I don't worry about that. I mean, there's plenty of things I worry about. Um, and the socialization <laughs> thing always comes up, especially yep. for, for homeschoolers. Oh, um, my God, yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's funny because if you think about it, homeschool kids are are naturally around adults more. So they're actually... Right carrying on adult conversations way more often than than most kids are um and so they're learning those communication skills in a much more mature way than than most kids would to begin with um also because we're traveling like i mentioned like we end up running into families mm. all the time on the road and shoot just the the airstream because it's shiny and beautiful and like people just come up and talk to us all the time. Like it's super weird. Uh, so like 
we just by default like we have to we have learned how to talk to people and how to make acquaintance acquaintances and and honestly we've even met other families on the road that they have become really good friends with and they mm. email them all the time they're not you know face to face with them but but they're they're still making friends while they're traveling around it's just not in the sort of the traditional way that you would think yeah and i, I told told these people again then oh yeah yeah absolutely and and marion you have some experience there right you you homeschooled right right i mean i homeschooled one child because we only had the one in an urban place because we live in portland but Oh my God, the people who said, oh, oh, how would they get any social life? What about their social development? Drove me nuts. People would be asking my daughter who was out with her friends on the city bus, how do you get, how do you get a social life? And she's like, <laughs> I'm here talking to you right now. Right. <laughs> I'm not staring at my shoes or looking at I my know. phone. Right, I'm right. What, you, what else do you want from me? Yeah. See, I mean, that's something I'm really on board with is that I think obviously education and socialization and all those things are important, but I also think that life experience uh, for kids is super important. I, I think one of the biggest gifts my parents ever gave to me was that when we were younger, we traveled all over the place. And we saw lots of different people, lots of different cultures, lots of different ways of doing things. Um, my, my mother was in the Peace Corps when she was younger and continued that kind of work. So we went all over the place. And I think that is honestly probably one of the best things that they could have done for me, you know? And <clears throat> we're talking about, um, there, there's this upcoming uh, Dot All uh, craft conference in Berlin. And I told my wife, well, you know, why don't we bring the, the wife and kids? Like, we'll bring everybody head over there. And she's like, oh, but, you know, they would miss a couple of days of school. And my, my position on that is that, you know, the life experience that you're going to get by visiting other places and seeing different people that do things a different way, you know, you can miss a couple of days of school. You know, they're, if they miss making a hand turkey for a day, like big deal. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Big deal. Agreed. So do you think that your your kids are a little more well-rounded, having been able to kind of travel from place to place, see different places and different people living different lifestyles? Well, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's sort of the hope is that is that we're preparing them to do amazing things that aren't sort of the status quo, right? Yeah. I mean, we're right. we're showing them that, you know, like we can do whatever, like you don't have to be, you can be in one place. That's totally fine. But like, if you want to, you can be all over the place. You can go to these amazing places that you never heard of. You can have these experiences. Um, and we just, we really hope that it sort of, maybe this is cheesy, but like expands their mind, you know? So no, that, totally so get not, it. Yeah. Totally I mean, get it. Because we hope. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, one of the problems is that, you know, if you grow up, maybe you grow up in a small town and you never leave that small town like it, that your whole mind is kind of wrapped around that one particular thing, you know. Yeah. And the great promise of the Internet was that we would all be able to connect to each other and there would be open ideas and all that kind of stuff. But what has actually happened is it's reverted to like a, a kind of a base tribalism. You know what I mean? People don't go out on the internet seeking different or opposing ideas. They seek to reinforce their own. And what has happened is instead of kind of this being this worldwide connection and open exchange of ideas is that people are kind of congregating in a tribal way on their little islands. You know what I mean? Because people love to have their own opinions on things reinforced. And I think the fact that you are uh, traveling not just physically around the country, but in a nomadic way, kind of injecting yourself into different uh, people that live in different ways. I mean, that probably is exposing your kids to some some really, really, maybe even mind expanding stuff. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely expanded our minds. Like we've run across so many just things and areas and people that we just we had no idea existed. Right. And it's been, it's just been really cool to to experience that. So what what stands out to you? Like what? thing or experience or whatever that you ran into that you probably never would have had had you not embarked on this lifestyle like what what is one or two things that kind of stand out in your mind hmm okay let's see uh so the the first one that we always bring up it's it's everybody's like top 
top choice. You ask the kids where their favorite place is because inevitably that's like the first thing everybody asks. What's your favorite place? Right. Um, so yeah, favorite place is the Dry Tortugas. Ah, um, uh, yeah. Which is a, it's basically an island 70 miles off the coast of Key West. Um, and it is, it's like the largest masonry structure in the Western hemisphere. And it's on an Island out in the middle of nowhere. It's an old fort. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you can, you can take a ferry out there or you can take a plane out there. uh, And so it takes out like a couple hundred people a day and which is fine. And, you know, there's like beaches and there's snorkeling and there's this, you know, this huge uh, fort there that you can go explore. What's cool is, is if you, if you plan it right, you can tent camp there Mm -hmm. overnight. And so every afternoon around two or three o'clock, all 200 people leave and you're left with maybe five people, 10 people that are on this Island out in the middle of the ocean. Um, And it was just magical. I mean, you know, the stars were insane because there's no light pollution. Right. Yeah. Um, The water, had like these bioluminescent organisms. Oh them. yeah. Those are so cool. And you could like, you could touch the water and the water would like light up and like follow your hand. Yeah. Whenever you splash, um, it's like a little fireworks explosion in the water. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, Oh man, you could, the, the, the actual fort had a big moat that you could walk around. And so there, the area in between the moat had all kinds of, you know, crazy, uh, wildlife and ocean life and the snorkeling was just amazing the coral reefs and there were mm-hmm. some old uh jetty poles that were there that had stuff growing up all around them and and you could just just swim out there and just see whatever you wanted to um and that was oh and there's shell island too so there are not shell island but i can't remember the name of it but connected to it is a bird sanctuary um but on that island uh, our conch shell there's like thousands of like beautiful pristine conch shells that mm-hmm. just washed up on the shore um you couldn't take any because it's a national park <laughs> right but it was it was still it was really really cool and, and plus um, if you're in a, a 200 square foot trailer you're not going to put a conch shell in there right <laughs> i would have put one of those in there it was beautiful yeah okay uh, yeah but no you're right we don't we don't buy a lot of stuff you can't be you can't be like connecting or collecting knickknacks and stuff like that right because no we can't so i mean part of what you're doing is not just a uh not just traveling around and uh kind of doing a live work play but you're also kind of embracing a simple living philosophy right oh for sure yeah i mean we went from a a big house here in tennessee it was like 2700 square feet you know down to the first RV, which was like 320 or 350 or something. Um, and then, you know, down to this, to the Airstream, which is even smaller. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, and even when we got here to Knoxville, after having lived in the Airstream for a year and a half, like we went through another purging process. So we're, you know, we're constantly like reevaluating what we have, like the things that we have. Do we actually use this stuff? is if we use it, do we enjoy using it? Is it high quality enough to keep around? Right. Um, Are there issues with it? Uh, Like we just decided to leave all of our tent camping gear because we had a really poor experience uh, tent camping at White Sands National Monument. Mm -hmm. And we, we tent camped overnight and it was below freezing and our gear was not made for that. And we were like miserable the whole night. Yeah. It <laughs> so gets we, cold in the desert, man. It does. Well, and the thing about white sands is it's gypsum sand. So it doesn't retain any heat whatsoever, even like at a hundred degree day. Yeah. It repels and so at it all. night. It re, yeah. It, like the ground got even colder than it was outside. And so it was, it was not a fun night. And I, it kind of solidified for us that even though we really wanted to have those tents and to go backpacking to these cool places, we just weren't ready for it, but also we didn't have the right gear for it. Right. And rather than keep a bunch of gear that wasn't working for it, we just got rid of it all. Um, and that's and something we did you... the same thing with bikes too. We, we had a bunch of bikes for the first year. We really wanted to be like a biking family and we just realized that we weren't. And right. so we just got rid of them. Yeah. And, and that's something you realize when you move is how much crap you've accumulated that you <laughs> yeah, don't really yeah. need. And I know Patrick just went through this, so he can probably speak to it, but it is amazing 
the amount of crap that you keep around. And that's why moving sucks. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we had one of those dumpster bags out front. And even then, that didn't even come close to covering the, the amount of stuff that we got rid of. And right. Gosh. Yeah, it's almost one of those, like, you have to put something aside for six months. And if six months have gone by and you just have not touched it, like, do you really need it in your life? Or, yeah, maybe if it's seasonal, that's something. But, right. yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think that that's really interesting because, you know, we're all only on this planet for so long. And the accumulation of, of crap that you don't use probably isn't going to be something that when you're on your deathbed, you're like, oh, I'm really glad I've got that, you know, corkscrew with a, a coconut head on it that I got in Hawaii, right? You're, you're going to be, you know, I mean, you're going to be thinking about the life experiences, the people you've met, the, the places you've seen. Um, and that's why I, th I find your um, story very compelling and, and very interesting, um, Jonathan, is that you are really living the work, live, play mentality. Um, and every day is that, you know, you're not working your ass off for uh, 350 days out of the year and then trying to de decompress and take a vacation, mm. you know, yeah. Um, yeah. which to me sounds like it's it's kind of similar to. Uh, people who want to lose weight, right? The way that you lose weight is not by going on a, a crash diet, you know, where you just go crazy for a short amount of time trying to, to lose the weight. The way you lose weight is that you change your lifestyle in terms of you just live differently or you eat differently. And it's doing that consistently that will allow you to lose weight, right? Because your body, your body reflects your lifestyle, right? And in a similar way, um, if you're working your ass off 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's going to be really difficult for you to then kind of get back to normalcy just by taking a, a two week vacation somewhere, you know? Yeah. So it's I, just not healthy either. Yeah. Term. Yeah. So I, I think it's really interesting the way that you're able to, um, to integrate this in your life. And I, you know, I, <laughs> I certainly don't do it to the extent that you do. Um, but I do try to do similar things and where, you know, I will work for a certain amount of time and then other parts of the day, I'll just devote to something that I want to do myself. You know, I go for a hike every day. Um, that really helps with my mental sanity. Um, and then also just to be able to spend time with the kids. Um, and I think it's amazing, Jonathan, the way that you have managed to balance all this stuff, but I got a hard question for you. Mm. So rewind the clocks future you is going to have a talk with past you when you're just about to think about embarking on going on this journey where you pack everything up uh, into your RV and you, you hit the roads. First of all, do you advise, does future you advise you to do it or do you say, don't do it? Oh, definitely do it. Definitely yeah. do it. I like it. Yeah. And then what piece of advice would you give past you or pieces? You know, <sighs> It's funny, like, you know, the things that, that we know now would have been nice to have known when we started, but I don't think we could have known them without going through right. the situations. Like, for example, you know, we started out, you know, with that huge RV and found out within a year that it just wasn't for us. Like, we couldn't take it off grid. It was too tall. It was too heavy. Um, it was too comfortable. It was like a house. I mm -hmm. mean, it had a fireplace in it. It was ridiculous. Oh my God. Um, yeah. And, and it got to the point where it's like, well, we're just, we're sitting in here watching TV every night, just like we would do at our house. Right. And that defeats the whole purpose. Yeah. What's the um, point now you've got a mobile living room that you watch TV on. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so like when we renovated the Airstream, the only way that we could have done it and done it the way we did it was to know what we didn't want and mm. what we did want and mm -hmm. how specifically we wanted to live this lifestyle but until you actually try to do it there's no way to know like right. there's so many like little particular things that that you think it's going to go a certain way and then you get out there and it's like oh well, that's not at all what i thought this was going to be like and maybe you needed um, the process just to grow yourself we, yeah we did and so i mean you know looking back i don't know that there's a whole lot i would tell myself because i had to go like we had to go through that like mm -hmm. we had to learn those things ourselves to really figure out who we were and what we wanted to do and how we wanted to live specifically um huh. I, I get another tough yeah. question for you so the the pace of modern web development is crazy 
Yes. Like it is insane yeah. in, in terms of, um, you know, what the, the new technologies, the new ways of doing things, the front end JavaScript, you know, I mean, everything like it's just insane. Do you ever find it difficult to, to keep up with it? Um, the fact that you're kind of living this more balanced lifestyle. Yeah. Um, and that, that's probably the, is one of the downsides of, of spending more time, you know, with the family and doing the adventuring stuff is there's less time for the business building right? Um, or the learning new things. And what I've sort of realized, uh, especially the last several years of things have gotten so crazy is that most clients really don't care. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and I can, I'm fine to do things the way that I know and that I'm the most efficient at. Um, and they don't really care either way, as long as I do it well and it's compatible and, uh, and it's done in a way that, that seems like a good value to them. And also you um, can wait until things sort themselves out, right? Like all of these well, the other frameworks yeah, I mean, competing I'll, and you can be just like, sure. all right, you know, I'll wait until we figure out what the best one is. And then maybe I'll use that. You know, I don't like to use my clients as Guinea pigs. So, um, yeah, like I want to make something that's going to work for them for a long time. Right. Um, not that I don't want to continue to work with them, but like, I just, I like to build things that last. And so, I mean, even with, you know, craft CMS, I mean, I didn't, I didn't even jump on that to like version two, you know, I was just kind of was letting it, letting it sort itself out and yeah, me sure either. until it was, it was ready to, to use for, for the kind of sites that I needed to use it for. So yeah. I, I'm not worried about getting left behind there. That doesn't stress me out too much. Um, and also like we were kind of alluding to earlier, on your deathbed, you're probably not going to wish that you had really dived into, you know, roll up JS or something. That's <laughs> you know? true. You're going to be, you're true. going to be glad that you got to visit <laughs> White Sands. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, that's 100. percent Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's why I wanted to have you on. Is that I think that your, you know, the the modern development world that we're in is just insane, and I think it's really interesting to have you on as kind of a sanity check, um, and also to see how you can be a freelancer and actually be free, you know, to, and, and maybe the way you're doing things in your lifestyle, uh, wouldn't be for everyone, but everyone can have their own kind of version of freedom and, and thing that works for them. Uh, oh but, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but does anyone here have any, uh, any questions that they're like, uh, Lauren, you know, or Patrick or Marion that you, uh, kind of want to ask Jonathan while we got them? No, this has been really interesting. I, I mean, the closest I ever came was a couple of weeks where we were in Japan. This is before children, and uh, right. you know, the, the time zones made that pretty difficult. I, but uh, even if I was on the same time zone, um, it, it's impressive how you've been able to make this easy, and it sounds like have a great life for you and your kids and, and family. So, no, this has been really interesting. So, Lauren, you said you have got a little, uh, a few nomadic bones in your body. Does this talking about this give you the itch? Uh, definitely. <laughs> I'm thinking about my next trip now and like where I'm going and what's next for me. <laughs> and are, are you in a position where you could just kind of, you know, pack up and leave and, and spend, you know, several months somewhere or is that not where you're at right now? Uh, not exactly, but I, I could spend extended periods away, but not, I would say not months and months at a time, but, right. uh, yeah, pretty flexible. Yeah. Yeah. I like to have a, a home base, but I, I like to also see other parts of the world as well. Well, very cool. Well, Jonathan, uh, thank you for coming on. And I think it was a really interesting talk. And we will make sure, like, if you can uh, hit me up and give me in the uh, the show links, um, like Campendium and some of these other links that uh, we'll definitely want to put in there. Sure, um, yeah. But that about wraps it up for another episode of the devmode.fm podcast. To have every episode delivered to your favorite podcast player, subscribe to our RSS feed or subscribe via iTunes or Google Play. And if you like what we're doing, leave us a review. And you can follow us on Twitter at devmode.fm. And we'd love to hear your thoughts on this episode. Just leave us a comment on the devmode.fm website. And normally I would completely sign off, but there's one other thing that I just remembered that I wanted to mention to you, Jonathan. So your um, kind of lifestyle where sometimes you're connected and sometimes you're not, uh, dovetails with, uh, something that we're going to be talking about on an upcoming podcast, which is going offline. Um, and it's a, a way to use service workers where you can handle situations, um, 
where you have internet coverage that is spotty. Um, and I wanted to mention that because I thought you might find that kind of interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the basic idea is that you are, you are able to make a web page that um, can kind of pre-download various pages or various things that you think people might want to visit. And even if you lose your internet connection completely, um, the people can still navigate as if it's a, uh, a native app, um, which is kind of cool. And I thought it might be something that would interest you. Um, and you can even do things like you can have a, an online store where you can place a, a couple of orders. And let's say then you go into the subway where you lose internet entirely. Uh, the website can remember your order. And as soon as you come back online, it will then transmit it. That's pretty fancy. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to mention that, you know, it kind of dovetails with um, you going offline some in some places you're at. And uh, the web is kind of trying to move into that space as well. Yeah. In any Very event, cool. for the devmo.fm podcast, I'm Andrew Welch. I'm Lauren Dorman. I'm Marian Nulevant. I'm Patrick Harrington. And thanks again, Jonathan, for coming on. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. I just wanted to let everyone know how much I suck, despite all of that talk about the <laughs> local recording and having to hit complete recording and everything, Jonathan. I forgot to hit the I was start. wondering. I thought I was supposed to hit it. I was like, oh, no. <laughs> no. I, I was like, oh, zero hours. I'm like, it has to be on my end. Of your, yeah. your lovely host forgot to hit the record button. So <laughs> we are going with the uh, backup recording once again. Yes, you do have a local. So we have been, yeah. Uh,